I'll start off with indexes. And you know, as you know, the, the indexes, the role in the stock market is basically that it's a proxy for how the overall market is doing. People use it as a nice, fairly easy way to digest the performance of a market. And this goes for any asset, actually, bonds or gold or you know, whatever. Um, and I guess not gold, but metals. Um, so, you know, indexes, I think the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was one of the first ones that people really started using commonly. And it's just people basically think of the two, uh, the stock markets and indexes as almost inseparable. And the thing is that the, the actual index that you use can matter a lot. Um, you know, if you have the, the Dow average, that worked really well when it was started up in 1890 or so because it was measuring a lot of the market. But it's 30 companies, so it actually doesn't measure a lot of the market. It's just some of the biggest companies. And, um, and it's also interesting because it's the way changes are calculated is based on the actual stock price. It's not based on how big the company is. So for instance, IBM, which has a share price that's you know, um, the, one of the highest share prices, I think it's around 120 or so right now. When it moves, it'll have a bigger effect on the index than Alcoa at $12, just because if IBM moves $5, even if it's a lower percentage than Alcoa moving two dollars, it, it'll have a bigger effect on the index. It's the five versus the two. It's not the you know a ten percent change versus a two percent change. So a lot of people feel like the Dow Jones Industrial Average is actually pretty out of date. Although um, when when people from around the world look at the U.S. market they often are really mostly interested in the Dow average. Um, you know, when, when I, I used to do radio, a, a radio hit for Sydney, um, so Australia, it was Friday afternoon and it was their Saturday morning. They didn't care about anything other than the, the Dow average, even the S&P 500 or whatever, and not, don't need it, just the Dow. So, you know, it, I don't know if that's your experience. Is, is that the main index that people know about for the US, is the Dow? Or do people think about things like the S&P 500? OK, that's good. So we have that. And, um, and of course, the S&P 500 itself, it's, you know, it's much broader, obviously. So it takes into account a lot more companies, a lot more industries. And it's a better representation of what the market is doing. But it still is, it, you know, it has its own particular sector because it's still very large companies. The smallest company in the S&P 500 is probably um, a market cap of about $10 billion. So while it's measuring those top 500 companies, it's not looking at the smaller companies, how they're doing. So there's a mid-cap index from the S&P, there's a small cap, you know, there are indexes from Russell, there's Russell 1000 and 2000, but the, and then there's even a Dow Jones index, the Dow Jones Wilshire 5000, um, that kind of gets the really overall US market. But just as, as you look at something like, for instance, the Euro stocks 50 versus the stocks Europe 600, be thinking about that as to what you're really measuring with that index that you're talking about. You know, and we were talking earlier about the, the um, European VIX that is, that's based on the Euro stocks 50. So that's, um, that's measuring volatility in 50 of the top European companies, which may not reflect real European volatility because if people are more concerned about the smaller companies, you won't see that in, in that measure. Um, so, and I alluded to it earlier with the price weight for the Dow average, but you can do a lot of different things with indexes and people have come up with all sorts of tricks, but the, the main one people use is market cap weight. So 
Apple is going to have a bigger effect on the index than other things because it has a larger market cap. And you guys know what market cap is? The, um, it's, it's basically how much a company is worth overall. So if you, if you take all the, the stock and you know, sometimes occasionally other things, but you know, mostly it's the stock price times shares outstanding is the main measure. Um, so, so the bigger a company is, the more effect it has on an index. That's the usual thing. That's how S&P 500 does it. Sometimes you'll get something like an equal weight index where every company in the index can move it the same amount. And you know, people do that for a variety of reasons. Um, there are some things like with the NASDAQ 100, Apple has become it, or became such a big percent of the index that people started doing other things to, you know, to try to tamp down its effect on the index because it was just, oh, Apple moved higher, Apple moved lower. And that was, you know, and that was when Apple shares were a lot higher. It, I guess they got up to 800 something. Now they're down around 450. So, um, you know, and, and and next thing with the indexes is, you know, how people make the changes. And actually, the changes can matter and be kind of interesting because that can have an effect on the stock prices. You know, it. Um, I guess Chuck probably talked with you about um, index funds, and you know, so there will be funds that follow indexes, like the Vanguard S&P 500 fund is a big one that was started in the early 70s, and it's an index of that owns, or sorry, it's a fund that owns S&P 500 companies. It reflects the index, and and the theory on that is that. With investing, you usually can't beat the market, so just go along with the market and you'll be better in the end than trying to, to outperform and maybe losing and stuff. So when those index funds go into a stock, like say a stock is named to the S&P 500, all those index funds will have to buy into that stock once it, w once it goes into the index. And people know that, so once it's named and before it gets in, they'll pile into the stock knowing that a place like Vanguard will have to buy the shares later. So you definitely see big moves in stocks from index changes, and that's all over the world. The main global one that you see it in is the MSCI index changes, which happen... Um, once every quarter, but the big ones are once every six months. And actually, um, I was looking into it. The, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index um, does have, it has 819 companies, and one of them is Ukrainian, Colonel, I think. So it, you are represented in, in the Emerging Markets Fund. But, um, yeah, so, you know, it just... It, the changes can can matter if you're looking at, you know, what if you're looking at why companies are moving. That's a big reason they could be. If if you can monitor, if you know when index changes are going to occur, you can speculate on that. And actually, a lot of um, banks try to do that. This is really common in Europe. Actually, I think. Um, Soc Gen Societe Generale and a few others try to do this. They try to predict companies that are going into indexes. And you can do that more successfully or less successfully depending on the index. There are some that are pretty formulaic. Like the Russell indexes, people get them almost, um, people figure out the changes almost exactly. But then the S&P 500, it, you know, people are guessing what's going to go in there all the time. And, um, and I talked to the guy who's in charge of doing those indexes, and he said, I love it when people speculate and I just laugh at it. And, you know, cause they, they don't have a formula. They just, they can put it in whenever. And I actually think they avoid things that have gotten speculation. Um, you know, so index funds, as I was mentioning, they're, they're a huge business. Vanguard is just one of the ones that does it. But, you know, you can invest in these things and track them, and it's... Uh, um, it's easy for people to do. You also have ETFs based on the indexes. So like the MSCI Emerging Market you have in the US, it's, the ticker is 
EEM. So people can buy into those indexes pretty directly. And it, so, you know, tracking the markets or figuring out exactly what you want to invest in, but not be, you know, actively changing from this stock to this stock every day, doing sort of a, a broader look is possible through those. So, um, so when do the changes matter? For the index funds, they always matter because the index funds have to reflect what the index is doing. That's their job. The changes matter most when, when a stock finally makes it into an index and it sort of wasn't expected. So if a stock moves from the S&P's mid-cap index into the S&P 500, it'll move a little bit higher, but the big one is if something isn't in any index and it moves into the small cap or if it moves into the Russell 2000, which is also a small cap index. So, you know, it's like the, a fund has finally made it into that first layer. Those are when you get the big jumps in the stock. Um, you see this with, you know, MSCI Indonesia index, or, you know, some of the smaller MSCI, the smaller country MSCI indexes. You will see big jumps in shares when a stock is named to that. So, you know, I think it's worth paying some attention to the MSCI rebalances, you know, if you're looking at the regional things. Um, and as I mentioned, the speculation might not match the reality depending on how, how closely they hew. So, um, you know, notable indexes, and I chose non-Ukrainian ones, just sorry about that, but, you know. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the Euro stocks 50 is comprised of stocks in only 12 countries. So in addition to the fact that it's only 50 stocks, it's a pretty narrow section. The stock 600 has 18, 18 countries, but it's still not you know, a lot. And the WIG 20 has... Exchange M&A has been an interesting area in the past few years. And the main reason it's been, uh, it's been an issue is because the exchanges are sort of regarded by countries as representative of the country in a way that a lot of businesses aren't. Um, you know, the NYSE merger with, or the takeover by Intercontinental Exchange is about to close. And, you know, that was kind of, that got a lot of publicity because it's, it's the New York Stock Exchange and it's being taken over. I mean, it'll probably stay about the same. But, the interesting thing about the two other recent major exchange mergers that are actually happening is that they're both inner country. So there's one where Canada's TMX was taken over by a group of Canadian banks. And then there are two Japan exchanges that merged. And most of the others have been rejected because of the nationalist issue. Um, you had Singapore bidding for Australia's ASX. That didn't go through. You had Deutsche Borsa trying to merge with the NYSE. That didn't go through, and some of it they said was antitrust, but a lot of it was concerned that Europe would be taking over the New York Stock Exchange. So, you know, when when these things are being looked at, there is actually there is more to it than just does the business side make sense. It's a, a lot about the national pride. Um, still. You know, new exchanges are being created all the time. The U.S. has, you know, I think 12 options exchanges and maybe 13 or 14 stock exchanges. And, you know, they, they pop up around the world from time to time. And it is in some ways becoming easier, especially as you get the technology from the others. So, you know, um, my, my fun story about Warsaw actually was that the they had a tank of piranhas outside of the CEO's office and they said it was kind of representative of capitalism, you know, and, the, the, and they said, oh yeah, we used to have six and then the other five ate one of them. So, <laughs> so that's how, it, but I have to say, they were very proud of also having a lot of Ukrainian companies listing. And of course, they were saying the Ukrainian companies go there because they have, it's better access to capital markets and international money and things like that. So 
and it seems like there, that Warsaw is even kind of dominating over places like the Vienna Stock Exchange. So it, it seems like that's kind of the, the dominant regional player apart from Moscow. What works and what doesn't. One of the things that is that I always find funny with the markets is when people say like, oh, this thing will definitely tell you what's going to work. And the Super Bowl stock market predictor was great. So do you guys know the Super Bowl in the United States is American football? So we had this, it, it was this rule for, well, when, um, when a team from a certain conference won, it, there, it had something like a 90% correlation with the stock market going up the next Monday. And so people kept writing about this and saying, oh, this really works. But uh, you know, actually, some people said it works, and some people you know, basically said, you know, this is ridiculous. But there are so many things that people will say, oh, you know, this correlates 90%, but that doesn't mean it, it's right. So you just see a lot of crazy analysis out there, and you kind of have to look at it and say, would this actually make a difference? I know Chuck kind of touched on that with his stuff about, you know, looking, spotting frauds and whatever. But, you know, just because something looks like it moves an index doesn't mean it does. Um, and just to touch on some of the, the kind of broad categories, fundamental analysis is when people are looking at the actual companies and saying, you know, I think this stock should go up because of, because its business is doing really well, and because you know the, this competitor is really having trouble, so it's it's looking at the actual company. The technical analysis is where people look at movements in the stock prices and say, I think there's this pattern where the stock is going to go up or down. Um, they have these things like head and shoulder patterns. So if it goes like this, they think it's going to go up, or you know. So it's um, I actually work with one technical analyst, but in I can barely understand what it is, but sometimes you'll see that stuff where, where you'll see a golden cross or a death cross. Death cross is bad. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, um, there are a lot of different approaches that people have that may, may or may not be good. That that is a good one. Um, you know, and one of the notable ones is this guy Bill Miller from Leg Mason, who everyone wrote about for years because you know, he he outperformed it, his fund outperformed the S and P five hundred for fifteen years straight, and that was just incredible, right? Nobody else was doing anything like that, and everyone said Bill Miller is a god. And then he had. I think now he's had four years of underperformance, and finally he he sort of is isn't really managing the fund anymore. They kind of shoot him out. But you know, even he said that you know if like if you hadn't measured January first to December thirty first, if you had measured from any other month, he wouldn't have beaten the S and P five hundred each time. You know, it, so there are all these things where people will say, oh, look, this person has done these great things outperforming the market. But, you know, so many of the things don't really add up. And you will occasionally see things where somebody comes up with a new way to do something and it works for a while. But usually if they come up with something like that that is really successful, other people will then imitate them and it'll go back to not working anymore, or other people will take the other side of the trade. So, you know, there's, um, I just wanted to go through those really quickly, but do those all make sense, or do you have any questions on that? So, <laughs> okay. So, and then getting into the market mechanics, um, Lots of small glitches occur. You know, I am on the email list for exchanges, and you'll see stuff a fair amount of, you know, where, and they say it in a wonky way, the consolidated tape feed for this isn't working or something. So I would say probably once every two weeks or so, an exchange in the US will have some sort of issue where something isn't working. 
whether it's for a few seconds or a few minutes. And, you know, it's, it's usually not such a big deal. People find out about it. They, um, they try to compensate for it. But it can become a problem. It, sometimes the minutes go into hours. And this has happened a few times recently in European exchanges. Um, I think it happened in Spain just a month or so ago. And, you know, so then you're sitting there saying, okay, well, what's going to happen with the trading? And that's when people start to wonder, and it starts to affect the, the people who are, who are doing the trading. So, you know, that is when you go to the exchange and you, you start calling and saying, okay, what's up? What are you going to do about this? And, you know, it, and it does make people nervous because, you know, these things are supposed to be very solid. And, you know, if they're breaking down, that's, that can be a lot of money at stake. And you'll see things over time that, um, you know, sometimes there will be an error in an exchange that lasts for a few years. Um, the, let's see, I think... A U.S. exchange had that recently. Direct Edge had something where they had they had this error that had persisted over about three years, and they finally realized it. And I think they had to give something like three million dollars back to customers. And actually, this is about the one-year anniversary. It was yesterday. But do you did you all see the Knight Capital uh, meltdown? That was it was last August first. And it was basically this company that um, it was trying to deal with a change in the New York Stock Exchange's system. And it had all these program trades that it had set up by computer that were set to go. And the, it had a glitch. And so it just started freaking and you know buying things. And you would see these big jumps in the stock price. And so actually the first thing we ended up putting out about it was unusual moves seen in these stocks because we didn't know what it was, right? No one was telling us yet. And so finally, I called a guy at the New York Stock Exchange on the floor, and he said, all those trades are coming from Knight Capital. Okay, so we put something out about that, and it started to get around that this was actually a really big problem, and Knight ended up taking a $440 million loss pre-tax. Um, but you know, since, this, since in the exchanges, this stuff is such a big deal and reputation is such a thing, the firm ended up having to get bought because people didn't want to trade with Knight anymore. They were saying, if this is going to be such a problem for you, we, we don't want to have our money with you. So it's, um, you know, the thing with exchanges is basically that they, when they're fine, they're fine, and then when something goes wrong, it's really, it can really be a big deal. So this one, this is um, May 6, 2010. And, you know, so we're watching, and it's not a good day for the market anyway, right? Because you have it going down here, and that's probably a 1% drop or so. But all of a sudden, at about 2 p.m., it starts going down, and then boom, and this is an 8.6% drop right here. And it did come back pretty quickly. But, you know, that was just something where you had to react so quickly to it. I mean, and obviously this depends on how real time you are. If you're putting out a daily paper, you wouldn't necessarily have to be analyzing every second, but you would have to find out what happened anyway. And it is... It is tough with some of these moves where you'll get something, you'll say, okay, well, is that a big deal? And it'll pop back pretty quickly. This, of course, was a huge deal, and a lot of confidence was lost in the entire U.S. market for a few days. They ended up having to take away a lot of trades that had been done. But one of the things that happened was all these people had sort of fake quotes as backups. So it would be like you're saying, I want to buy this $10 stock, and I'm going to put out a bid or I'm going to say that the lowest bid I'll accept is, or the lowest I'll sell it for is, um, is 950. But then they would have this backup that was one cent. So all these companies went down and traded at one cent for a while, and they ended up canceling a lot of those trades. 
So basically any trade where the, the price was something like 40% or more off of, of what it had been was canceled. But, you know, stuff like this, while rare, does happen and kind of freaks people out. I think it happens more in the emerging markets than it does in a place like the U.S., but it, you know, and it's, I mean, it, we actually had sort of a funny thing where, you know, I told you yesterday about those hot headlines, the red ones that you put over everything. Um, we were putting out red headlines saying, you know, S&P 500 drops this much, and, and then when it was right about here, one of the, uh, this guy comes over and says, aren't you doing too many red headlines for this? We were kind of saying, it's down 8.6%. <laughs> we can't do too many, you know? <laughs> so, because everyone was paying attention to that at that point. But, you know, it's um, definitely when, when something like this happens, it's kind of all hands on deck and figuring out what, what caused it. And actually, one of the tricky things is that a lot of times you can't find out until days or months later um, in 2007, I was um, doing the, the markets column for the Wall Street Journal, and we would have moves in the Dow of like 300 points in the last 10 minutes of trading. Just going, I have no idea what's happening. And then it turned out, you know, over years of research, people found out that hedge funds were melting down, but nobody wanted to say it. And that is one of the tricks with the markets. If you can get someone to tell you what's really going on, that's great. But a lot of people don't want to talk about their failures. I actually think there's a lot of that, you know, um, remaining in Europe, especially with the private banks, for instance, that they don't want to talk about their, their investments that haven't gone well.